So hi everyone and welcome to the start of our uh, module on our discussion on a monopoly. So a monopoly is another type of market structure. So from the last uh, module, we discussed perfect competition. And uh, after that, so we're going to discuss another market structure, which we refer to as a monopoly, which I'm pretty sure most of you have heard of. So um, let's discuss first the assumptions under a, mon uh, a monopolistic market, which is how we're going to refer to it from now on. So in a monopoly... Okay, first, we assume that the market contains a single seller. So a single seller exists in the market. Therefore, there's only one provider okay, of a particular good or service. And uh, that provider, which is the monopolist, we refer to as the monopolist, will sell that good or service or that product. Uh, and that product has no closed substitutes, meaning... If you recall our assumption with a perfectly competitive market, each firm sells a homogeneous good. In this case, there is only one firm in the market that sells or that provides a typical good or service. So if you think of a popular examples of monopolies, they're like public utility companies that provide electricity or, uh, or broadband connections, etc. These companies have a sort of control over one good or service and there's really no close substitute essentially for that service and what we have is that because the monopolist will sell a product with no close substitute it assumes or we say that the monopolist demand curve okay the monopolist's demand curve okay is the same okay effectively as the market demand curve and we assume that market demand curve okay to be negatively slow. So we're going to discuss uh, or we're going to go between two different um, demand functions. Okay, And essentially, they correspond to the same thing. We have a direct, okay, a direct market, okay, market demand function, demand function. And that's essentially Q, uh, which is some function of P. Okay. And we assume that uh, it's negatively sloped, right? So if I take the derivative of quantity with respect to price, this should be uh, less than zero. And we also have what we call our inverse, okay, our inverse uh, market, okay, demand function. And uh, that one is going to be some function of P. With respect to q so that's p with respect to q and we can also infer that if we take the derivative of that with respect to q that's also less than zero and uh we're going to discuss more into these two demand functions later in the video another thing that we're going to emphasize is that a monopolist has market power okay and we're going to get into that in the subsequent videos but essentially the monopolist has some sort of power in setting prices or output, which is something that a perfectly competitive firm did not have to do because, or could not do because uh, they had to take the market price as given and their individual demand curves were essentially uh, horizontal lines reflecting uh, the market prices. Okay, and next is, okay, in a monopoly, the reason why a monopolist has some sort of power is because there are barriers to entry. And those barriers to entry okay, prevent other firms from entering the industry. So in a perfectly competitive market, firms could enter and exit. In a monopoly, it's not so easy. And effectively, it's quite impossible. And effectively, these barriers to entry are the source of monopoly power. So they come in many ways. First is a monopolist could potentially have control over scarce productive resources, i.e. a firm that controls the entire supply of a vital factor of production will likely control the production for the entire industry. For example, say a firm had a huge control over the spectrum, they would most likely have a huge control over the entire mobile industry. Another one is patent rights, and essentially it's a legal barrier to entry, and it's an exclusive right granted to an inventor by government to a product or a process that they invented. So it's pretty much commonplace when we get to medicine, 
or to certain pharmaceuticals wherein they get exclusive right to sell the product for a limited amount of time. So they have monopoly power during that time. Another one is uh, they have access to unique managerial talent, which could increase their productivity. And they have uh, the ability to utilize economies of scale. So as they go up and up in production, since they're the only producer that's there, their costs would be declining. Okay, And it's natural because it would be inefficient for two or more firms to produce a good or service. We're going to get into that concept later on in the course. And another reason or another barrier to entry is that uh, the government could have given them a franchise agreement to be the sole provider of a good or service in exchange for some conditions. So, for example, um, a publicly authorized monopoly, such as those that provide electricity and uh, other utilities like water, and these are typically the firms okay, that uh, benefit from these franchise or get these franchises and the government has some sort of control with them and the, the, the reason why they're made into monopolies is because they can utilize the large economies of scale to potentially okay not all the time but potentially decline or decrease the cost okay so let's now go on to how a monopolist sort of thinks or how it behaves so the monopolist okay, is assumed to be a profit maximizer. It tries to maximize its profit like a typical firm. And how it can maximize profit, okay, pi is profit in this case, uh, is quite unique in that it can maximize profit with respect to variations in output or, okay, or is important, price. But it cannot set both independently since if it could, for example, it chooses to set its price, okay, say the firm chose to set its price, the monopolist chose to set its price, its uh, output, okay, is uniquely determined, okay, by the demand curve, okay. Uh, on the other hand, say the monopolist set its output, its price will be determined by its demand curve. So it cannot set both independently, one is dependent to another. Hence, we have the direct and the inverse that we talked about earlier. So let's go on to concepts on average revenue and marginal revenue. So uh, as you probably expect, okay, the total revenue of a monopolist, okay, so that's revenue, is essentially P or the prevailing price times Q or the amount that it sells. And we know that P in this case, so for example, uh, let's go with our case that it sets P. P is some function of Q, okay, times Q. And uh, we know that uh, from our first assumption, okay, that the demand curve, okay, it should be downward sloping, okay, which corresponds to the marginal revenue curve, should be less than zero. Now, the marginal revenue curve is essentially the derivative of that revenue, of total revenue, with respect to Q, okay? And we can write this, okay? So uh, using this one here, we can write this in this way. So if we derive it, this is going to be PQ plus Q times uh, the derivative, okay? Because Q is some function, uh, P is some function of Q. So we have the Q. So we can write that derivative in that form, okay? And that corresponds to your marginal revenue. So suppose uh, a monopolist increase its production by one unit, then revenue will increase by the amount of marginal revenue. So since, okay, what we know is since, okay, since, okay, we assume that uh, this derivative, okay, is less than zero, then it must be that to satisfy this condition that we have here, then uh, MR should be less than price, okay? Now, what does that mean? What does that condition mean? It means that the monopolist, okay, the monopolist, okay, must reduce, reduce the price it receives for every unit in order to sell another unit, okay? And it's just a continuity assumption that we'll start to discuss again in the subsequent videos to follow.
So again, this one stems from the inverse demand uh, market demand function, which represents the negative slope of the marginal revenue curve. And that's generally uh, less than price. Okay, now average revenue, as you recall from perfect competition, that's just essentially equal to revenue over uh, Q. And in our case, that's going to be equal to P. Okay, and we'll show this in another video. And essentially, okay, that average revenue curve is the monopolist's demand curve. So this is the monopolist's okay, demand curve. Is essentially its average revenue curve. So uh, we're going to show that in another video. Another key concept to try and understand is on marginal revenue and the price elasticity of demand. So suppose we have the, the uh, direct uh, market demand function, so that's QP. And again, we said that uh, it's negatively sloped, so this condition should hold true. Okay, And we can define a price elasticity of demand, which we discussed before, which is equal to this one, elasticity price. So that's epsilon of our epsilon P. It's equal to this derivative, Q, P over DP times P over Q. And we find that this is always less than zero for all positive quantities and prices, which is logical in the market. Okay, so... Uh, that's the, that holds okay whenever okay whenever that derivative okay is indeed negative. So remember, we impose that assumption of a downward sloping marginal revenue curve, or a marginal a downward sloping uh, relationship between price and quantity, like always. So what we're gonna do is okay, essentially we're gonna let okay well, we're gonna take the absolute value of this. So let uh, let the absolute value of the elasticity be equal to uh, essentially because it's always negative so that's negative dqp dp times p over q q which is always greater than zero then if you recall our interpretations from before if that elasticity is greater than one okay then the market demand is price elastic if that elasticity is equal to one, then that market demand is unit price elastic. And if that elasticity is less than one, okay, then uh, the market demand is price inelastic. So when the demand is price elastic, uh, a small change in price, for example, if that was the control variable, the, the variable that the monopolist is trying to control, will have a huge, uh, implic will have a huge effect on the demand. If it's uh, unit elastic, uh, the proportions are quite the same. And if it's inelastic, a small change in price, say a small price increase will only lead to a smaller, okay, to a smaller decrease in uh, market demand because of the inelastic demand. So let's now link this one, this concept, to marginal revenue. So again, from earlier, we said that marginal revenue is equal to PQ plus Q times DPQ over DQ, okay? And we can rewrite this as uh, P times Q times uh, 1 plus, uh, I'm just going to rewrite this in some form, plus you can verify your proofs in another time, Q times Q over PQ, okay? So we can write it like that. And what you'll notice is, okay, this entire term here is essentially the inverse of the elasticity. So this is P Q times one plus one over EP, okay, the elasticity. And we can infer that, okay, we can infer something about how the marginal revenue function's value is, okay? So when the elasticity of price okay, is greater than 1, i.e. when price is elastic, marginal revenue is greater than 0. Okay. If it's unit elastic, okay, uh, marginal revenue is equal to 0. And if we, the market demand is price inelastic, okay, 
it suggests that the marginal revenue is less than zero. So those are a few introductory concepts to a monopolist. In the next video, we'll discuss how a monopolist uh, maximizes its profit and minimizes cost. And I hope to see you in the lectures to follow. So thank you very much for watching.